For Comedy Hive News, I'm Elena Williams. In 1988, while promoting Coming to America at a press conference, Eddie Murphy was asked if he would reunite with John Landis, who directed both Trading Places and Coming to America. Murphy said, Vic Morrow has a better chance of working with Landis than I do. Now, to put that comment into context, Vic Morrow was an actor who was cast in Twilight Zone, the movie. In the film, a segment would be directed by Landis. On July 23, 1982, Morrow and two child actors were required to escape from a U.S. Army helicopter. According to sources, the helicopter hovered at approximately 24 feet when the heat from the special effects explosions reportedly delaminated the helicopter's rotor blades, which caused the helicopter to plummet and crash, killing all three. One child actor was crushed by the rotorcraft, while Murrow and the other child actor were decapitated. Before the fatal incident during pre-production of the film, Landis was met with resistance from California's child labor law. The casting agents of the film told Landis and the associate producers that regulations forbade children to work past certain hours. One of the casting agents recalled telling the director that the helicopter scene seemed kind of dangerous. Landis was also informed that because the children didn't have speaking parts, they were considered extras and could not be hired through the casting agency. Landis decided against getting a waiver to allow kids to work after the curfew. Sources say either he thought he wouldn't get the waiver because filming took place too late or he knew he couldn't get approval for having children around the helicopters and explosives. Landis decided to employ the child actors illegally and pay them out of pocket to avoid putting their names on the payroll. The grieving families filed lawsuits and were later settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. On June 15, 1983, Landis and two other members of the crew were charged with two counts of manslaughter for the child actor's deaths. Landis, along with two different members of the crew, were indicated on three counts of manslaughter because of aggravated, reckless, grossly negligent acts that resulted in all three deaths. While Landis and company were acquitted, he is constantly reminded about the Twilight Zone incident, and it's a huge blemish on his career. Although this act was not premeditated, it was Landis' disregard for the well-being of children and his refusal to follow child labor laws that contributed to this horrific accident. So, when Murphy said, Vic Morrow has a better chance of working with Landis than I do, it was the result of a difficult experience on set, one that had differed from their first time working together on Trading Places. What Murphy had gone through was so bad, he swore off working with the director ever again a promise he eventually wouldn't keep. Here's why Eddie Murphy fought the director of Coming to America. Twilight Zone the movie was released in June 1983, nearly three weeks after Training Places, Landis' first collaboration with Murphy. After taking 1984 off, Landis returned the following year with three projects, Into the Night, Spies Like Us, and Clue. In 1987, he directed Amazon Woman on the Moon before reuniting with Murphy for Coming to America. A 1990 Playboy magazine interview reveals that Murphy came close to directing Coming to America himself, but he gave the job to Landis as a favor. Interviewer, you could have directed Coming to America, but didn't. Why? Murphy. I wanted to help out Landis. I figure I'd give this guy a shot because his career was fucked, but he wound up fucking me. Interviewer, what happened? Murphy, as it turned out, John always resented that I hadn't gone to his Twilight Zone trial. I never knew that. I thought we were cool, but he'd been harboring it for a year. Every now and then, he would make little remarks like, you didn't help me out. You don't realize how close I was to going to jail. I never paid any mind. Interviewer, so you hired Landis out of friendship despite thinking he'd been irresponsible? Murphy, yes, he'd done four fucked up movies in a row and I knew he'd spent a lot of money on his trial. I went to Paramount and said I wanted to use Landis, but they had reservations. His career was fucked up, but I said, I'm gonna use Landis, I like the guy. I always used to say that the one fun experience I had with the director, and I've worked with directors, I really liked Marty Brest, Walter Hill, Tony Scott, was with Landis because he plays around a lot on the set. I made Paramount hire him. Interviewer, did you think he was guilty? Murphy, I don't wanna say who was guilty or who was innocent, but if you're directing a movie and two kids get their heads chopped off at fucking 12 o'clock at night when there aren't supposed to be kids working and you said action, then you have some sort of responsibility. So my principals wouldn't let me go down there and sit in court. That's just the way I am. If somebody in my family was guilty of something, I wouldn't sit there in a courtroom and say, you've got my support. Fuck that. The most it would be is, hey, you go work that out. I still love you. I'm still your friend. Interviewer, was he grateful? Murphy. 
He came in demanding lots of money. Paramount was saying, hey, come on, Eddie, we're getting fucked here. But I made them pay his money. They bent over backwards, but after he got the job, he brought along an attitude. Murphy then went on to explain exactly what problems occurred on set. What first put a bad taste in my mouth about him was when, after he hired Shari Headley and all these other people, I said I wanted to take everybody to dinner. I didn't know anybody, but Landis grabbed Headley. You stay away from Eddie. Don't go near him because he's gonna fuck you and ruin my movie. He just wants your pussy. I'm thinking, wait, oh no, that was nothing to do with being a fucking director. He's a control freak. Just assuming that I was trying to get the pussy is one thing, and even if I was trying to get the pussy for him to try and stop me from getting it because he was directing the movie, he's got a lot of nerve. There was another incident on set where Landis found out that some of Murphy's writers were working on a project for his production company. Landis began yelling at the writers, telling them that they shouldn't be in New York unless Eddie Murphy was paying them. Don't be afraid to ask Eddie Murphy for his money. You go up and ask for your fucking money, Landis said. At that moment, Eddie entered the room and Landis continued. Eddie, your company is fucking these guys out of their money. Guys, don't be afraid to go up to Eddie and say, fuck you. Eddie reflected on the moment saying, he's screaming about my deal making in front of the cast. I playfully grabbed him around the throat, put my arm around him and said to Fruity, one of my guys, what happens when people put my business in the street? And Fruity said, they get fucked up. I was kind of half joking. Landis reached down to grab my balls like he also thought it was a joke and I cut his wind off. He fell down, his face turned red, his eyes watered up like a bitch and he ran off the set. Fucking punk. After the incident, Landis allegedly went to Murphy's trailer. His voice was trembling and it all came out that he didn't think I was talented, that the only reason he did coming to America was for money, that he didn't respect me since I hadn't gone to his trial and all this bullshit called me ignorant and asshole. I'm sitting there shattered. I'm thinking this fucking guy, I bent over fucking backwards to get this guy a job. He probably won't even acknowledge what happened. He didn't realize that his fucking career was washed up. Murphy later added, you're gonna have to give me either some fear or some respect. I want one of them because this is my shit and you're working here. The altercation had frustrated Murphy so much that he had his first taste of alcohol to calm his nerves. According to a 1989 Rolling Stone interview, Murphy said, I drank once while making Coming to America. I had some weirdness with John Landis who was directing the movie. We had a tussling confrontation and when I went home, Arsenio gave me some alcohol to settle me down. I thought a drink might help, so I drank a whole quart of absolute vodka. I won the most vomit award. I was bent over the toilet for hours. That was the first and last time I'll ever drink. The interviewer of the Rolling Stone interview decided to go deeper and get more information about what happened on set. We didn't come to blows. Personalities didn't mesh. I grabbed him and he thought I was playing. So he tried to grab my balls and I pushed him away. But I wasn't kidding. He was doing some silly shit that made me mad. He directed me in trading places when I was just starting out as a kid, but he was still treating me like a kid five years later during Coming to America. And I hired him to direct the movie. I was gonna direct Coming to America myself, but I knew that Landis had just done three fucked up pictures in a row and that his career was hanging by a thread after the Twilight Zone trial. I figured the guy was nice to me when I did trading places, so I'd give him a shot. I'm a popular actor in this town, and to have a guy who was fucked as he was to get a job with me gave him some renewed credibility. I was going out of my way to help this guy, and he fucked me over. Now he's got a hit picture on his resume, a movie that made over $200 million as opposed to him coming off a couple of fucked up movies, which is where I'd rather see him be right now. The guy on Trading Places was young and full of energy and curious and funny and fresh and great. The guy on Coming to America was the pig off the world most unpleasant, arrogant, bullshit entourage. Just an asshole. However, Eddie is brilliant and he and I have always worked together well. There's never been an issue created. On Coming to America, we clashed quite a bit because he was such a pig. He was so rude to people. I was like, Jesus Christ, Eddie, who are you? But I told him. You can't be late. If you're late again, I quit. We had a good working relationship, but our personal relationship changed because he just felt that he was a superstar and that everyone had to kiss his ass. He was a jerk, but great in fact, one of the greatest performances he's ever given. Oddly enough, Landis and Murphy would end up working together one final time, six years later after Coming to America was released. Their final project together would be 
Beverly Hills Cop 3. And many years later, I was approached to do Beverly Hills Cop 3, and I asked, well, who's playing Eddie Murphy? They said, no, Eddie asked for you. So I met with him and he was pleasant. I still think it was his way of apologizing, but who knows with Eddie? He's so strange, a very odd fellow, but so talented. Landis went on to talk about his experience filming Beverly Hills Cop 3 and how that differed from coming to America. According to Landis, the script wasn't very good, but he thought he could make it work with Eddie. However, the development of the character Axel Foley was going in another direction. Foley was supposed to be more mature and no longer the wise-cracking rookie cop. Landis said that in the movie, Eddie was professional, just not very funny. Murphy, on the other hand, said that the third Beverly Hills Cop is atrocious and he wished the film was closer to the edginess of the first two movies. Disagreements between actor and director seem to be a part of the Hollywood culture, whether it's Bruce Willis versus Kevin Smith or Monique versus Lee Daniels. Sometimes the talent and crew don't see eye to eye. In this case, it was Eddie's belief that he was doing Landis a favor. However, he didn't see it that way. Coming to America would be the last hit movie Landis was a part of, as every film he directed after would fail to make its budget back. The aftermath of the Twilight Zone trial and his feud with one of the biggest movie stars at the time would contribute to Landis' falling out with Hollywood. Stay up to date with the latest news in comedy by subscribing here to our YouTube channel, follow Comedy Hype across all social media, and look out for more all new original content on our streaming platform at ComedyHype.com. For Comedy Hype News, as always, I am Elena Williams.